Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Written in Blood History, now part of the Evergreen Podcast Network. And thank you especially to those of you who leave me reviews and donate on Patreon. I'm forever in your debt. I think Nikita Khrushchev is an odd choice for a biographical subject, and I have to take a moment to thank Kara and Adam from the Time Travel Talks Discord group for recommending the biography by William Taubman that I use as the principal source. For a book that clocks in at about a thousand pages, I was admittedly skeptical as to how much I would actually enjoy reading about Khrushchev, but I was enthralled. I say an odd choice, because his life story isn't immediately interesting on face value, and he he wasn't a wartime hero, and his legacy as Soviet premier is largely defined by the Cuban Missile Crisis, and in turn is greatly overshadowed by his adversary, John F. Kennedy. He wasn't exactly charismatic, and his quotes aren't profound or weighty. In fact, and consider this an official language warning, he was not afraid to use crude, coarse, and by today's standards especially, derogatory language. So again, language warning, if this sort of thing offends you, now is the time to tune out. But despite all the reasons not to give Nikita Khrushchev a second look, it's important to remember that As the unexpected successor to Stalin's Soviet Union, he found himself wielding that extraordinary power in an equally unexpected way. And hopefully, if I do my job right, you'll be as enthralled as I was. And so now, I present to you the life of Nikita Khrushchev, the Brinksman, Part 1. December 1st, 1962, an art exhibit was on display, and the Soviet premier, the first secretary of the Communist Party, and the chairman of the Council of the Ministers of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, was going to personally attend. His presence was a significant symbolic step in what has been referred to as the Thaw, a time of leniency after so many years of oppressive hell from his predecessor Stalin. Cameras rolled as Khrushchev walked into the gallery, grinning ear to ear, his beady little eyes looking each artist in the face, shaking their hands. The premier entered the gallery and observed the first piece of modern art. Its proud creator, stiff as a statue, was nervously standing next to it as if it was a submission at a school science fair. But Khrushchev's smile slowly transformed into a look of disgust. When he didn't speak for a few moments... The tension grew thick in the gallery. Finally, 
Nikita Khrushchev hollered, quote, It's dog shit. A donkey could smear better than this with his tail. You're a nice-looking lad, but how could you paint something like this? We should take down your pants and set you in a clump of nettles until you understand your mistakes. You should be ashamed. Are you a faggot or a normal man? Do you want to go abroad? Go then. We'll take you as far as the border. We have a right to send you out to cut trees until you've paid back the money the state has spent on you. The people and the government have taken a lot of trouble with you, and you pay them back with this shit. End quote. As Khrushchev walked away from the artwork in a huff, the angry artist exploded in response, shouting, quote, Give me a girl right here and now, and I'll show you what sort of a homosexual I am. End quote. To another artist, Khrushchev turned his attention. Quote, the Dutch masters painted differently. You can look at their paintings through a magnifying glass and still admire them. But your painting just gives a person constipation, if you'll excuse the expression. End quote. And to another artist, quote, Is that a horse or a cow? Whatever it is, it makes an ugly mockery of a perfectly noble animal. End quote. And to another, quote, If that's supposed to be a woman, then you're a faggot. And the sentence for them is ten years in prison. End quote. And yet, to another unfortunate artist whose work happened to catch the premier's attention, quote, Your art resembles this. It's as if a man climbed into a toilet, slid down under the seat, and from there, from under the toilet seat, looked up at what was above him, at someone sitting on the seat, looking up at that particular part of the body from below, from under the seat. That's what your art is like. That's your position, comrade Nizvesny. You're sitting in the toilet. End quote. Poor, poor Comrade Nisvesny. Your reaction to the outburst by Khrushchev might be one of horror, outrage, and by today's standards, these outbursts are quite outrageous. But consider this. Though these artists suffered a tongue lashing in public humiliation, and for the most part, the modern art movement went underground after this incident, none of them were shot, disappeared, or sent to the gulags for rehabilitation. And this is precisely the contradiction that is Nikita Khrushchev. He's the man who not only led de-Stalinization, but made it Soviet policy. He's the man who first denounced the terrible crimes committed by one of the most awful human beings of the 20th century. He's the one who removed from power a horrific monster of a man who nearly became Stalin's successor. He's the one who pressed for reform, who wanted a more open Soviet Union, who desperately wanted peaceful relations with the West, while at the same time bringing the world to the brink of nuclear war and challenging American power like no man ever had. And frankly, in a way no one has ever even come close to since. He is a man who truly loved the Russian working class and peasantry and wanted them to prosper. He wanted them to take pride in their Russia, in their great Soviet Union. He was a true believer in communism and the utopia that it promised, while at the same time striking the first blow against it. He was a pragmatist, and yet his outbursts, at times, as we've seen, seem to resemble the old dark days, the days of Stalin, the days of oppression and cult. These contradictions are what make Khrushchev, in this podcaster's opinion at least, one of the most interesting biographical subjects of our age. Nikita Khrushchev was born on April 15, 1894, in the village of Kalinovka, Russia. His parents were desperately poor peasants. His father earned a living for the family as a miner. Peasant life in late 19th century Russia was not easy and fairly unchanged for the past couple of hundred years. It was a hard life, and the Tsar's economic policies weren't making it any easier. Though the peasantry had been freed from serfdom a few decades earlier, in their freedom, they were still slaves to a government bent on industrialization. They were serfs in all but name. Contemporary accounts of Russian peasant life around the turn of the century reads as follows, quote, All peasants, the rich as well as the poor, live, with very few exceptions, in the same narrow peasant's izba or hut, these homesteads consisting of a square 15 to 20 feet in length and width. In this space, divided into one or two rooms, both children and grown-ups are all huddled together. Cottages having no chimneys are still very common, and almost all have thatched roofs which often leak. And in the winter, walls are generally covered with dung to keep the place warm. A peasant family sleeps in two tiers, on benches and bunks behind the stove. Bathhouses are practically non-existent. They almost never use soap. Skin disease, syphilis, epidemics, undernourishment, such foodstuffs as meat, 
meal, bacon, and vegetable oils appear on the table on only rare occasions, perhaps two or three times a year. The normal fare consists of bread, kvass, which is a kind of non-alcoholic beverage brewed from bread, and often cabbage and onions, to which fresh vegetables may be added in autumn. End quote. By the time he could walk, little Nikita was working, as a peasant boy does, to help provide some sort of sustenance for his family, tending fields, cattle or sheep, or helping his father work for other more well-off peasants. From these days, Khrushchev recounts, quote, Every villager dreamed of owning a pair of boots. We children were lucky if we had a decent pair of shoes. We wiped our noses on our sleeves and kept our trousers up with a piece of string. End quote. Khrushchev recounts that his grandfather was illiterate and only bathed two times in his life, once when he was christened and once when his body was prepared for his burial. His grandfather's cow, he recalled, only gave enough milk to whiten the soup to hide the fact that it had no potatoes in it. Nikita's own home, during times when money was short, was a clay hut with a dirt floor. The little boy would sleep above the stove for warmth. His father slaved for and saved what money he could with the dream of one day buying a horse. With a horse, thought his father, he can then plow enough land to raise potatoes and cabbage for a starving family. But his father's dream was never realized. Schooling existed in some way, shape, or form from Khrushchev, quote, After a year or two of school, I had learned to count up to 30, and my father decided that was enough of schooling. He said that all I needed was to be able to count money, and I would never have more than 30 rubles to count anyway, end quote. On holidays, such as Christmas or Epiphany, the men in Kalinovka entertained themselves by organized fistfights in the streets. Everyone came out of their homes to watch the event. And such was the life that Nikita Khrushchev was born into. A hard life. And a cold life. The local school in Kalivnica had a teacher who was regarded by many parents as a bad influence, named Lydia Mikhailovna Shevchenko. Teacher Lydia was an atheist. And she made an impact on Khrushchev. Quote, I first saw banned political books at Lydia's house. Once I called on her, and she introduced me to her brother, who was visiting from the city and lying in bed. This is the boy I told you about. He is asking me for forbidden pamphlets, she said. Her brother smiled and replied, Give him these. Perhaps he'll make some sense of them. And then when he grows, he'll remember. End quote. It was in this moment Nikita Khrushchev discovered communism. And there's no way around this. It was a new secular religion. Yet this religion promised not utopia in some intangible afterlife, but a better life here and now. To a boy who slept above a stove and faced starvation every day, that's an attractive doctrine. And at the age of 14, to exacerbate his disdain for the status quo, Nikita was sent away 250 miles from home to work alongside his father in the mines to endure the splendor of industrial revolution where one describes the atmosphere as, quote, black. So were the roads. Not a tree was to be seen near the mine, not even a bush, nor pond, or even a stream. And beyond the mine, as far as the eye could see, only the monotonous, sunburned steppe, end quote. William Taubman, author of Khrushchev, The Man in His Era, notes well that the mines are where the anti-capitalists are born. Khrushchev's living and working conditions by today's standards are the stuff of nightmares. This was compounded by the disaster that was unfolding for the Russian nation in World War I. And Khrushchev did well despite the circumstances, however. He became a metal fitter's apprentice, and he ended up building his own motorcycle so he didn't have to walk to work anymore. His skills as a metal worker are in fact what kept him out of the war. He was fun to be around. He joked a lot, he talked a lot, he liked to dance, he loved music, and he knew everyone. And when somebody in the mines and factories needed a person to distribute revolutionary newspapers to the workers, Khrushchev was the obvious choice. When the workers wanted something from their bosses, Khrushchev was the go-to spokesman. And soon he began making friends with some older, wiser, and more revolutionary workers in his shop. In 1915, a strike broke out in the mine. Khrushchev was one of its leaders and organizers. On the national stage, the winds of change were blowing too. The detestable Tsar had abdicated his throne. And after the Tsar's government fell, then there came an interim government, shortly followed by famine. By the end of the post-Tsar period, power had changed hands 20 times. And just when it seemed like things were settling down for the Russian people, the Bolsheviks began their bloody revolution to collectivize the economy. In their wake, they left behind a trail of blood not just from capitalists, but from landowners and priests and Ukrainian nationalists and others deemed unnecessary in the coming utopia. 
from the peasants, this new army demanded food. And when the peasants refused, it was taken by force. And once again, the peasantry of Russia, unable to defend itself, was pillaged and left to starve. And many did. Seeing this new Red Army and Bolshevik Party as a force to be reckoned with, Khrushchev joined its ranks. At the very least, it kept him from starving. The party, as it came to be called, shacked Khrushchev up with a local noble family in St. Petersburg. His hostess challenged him and his party. Khrushchev recalled that she said, quote, Now that you communists have seized power, you'll trample our culture into the dirt. You can't possibly appreciate a fragile art like the ballet. She was right. We didn't know the first thing about ballet. When we saw postcards of ballerinas, we thought they were simply photographs of women wearing indecent costumes. End quote. Things started off bleak for the revolutionary government. A bag of flour cost 2 million rubles. A pound of meat, as much as 70,000. Typhus and cholera were rampant. Crops were failing. And in the district young Nikita was from, 38% were starving to death. 400,000 of them were children. A priest who recounted these dark days said, quote, Mothers kill their children and then commit suicide to put an end to their suffering. Everywhere we see people with haggard complexions and swollen bodies, people who can hardly drag themselves around and who are driven to eating dead cats and dogs and horses. End quote. At one house, a woman and her husband were making quite a good living by selling meat to their neighbors, but such bounty aroused suspicion. Upon a search of the house, authorities found two barrels full of butchered children, salted and preserved. The townspeople beat the couple to death. It was upon these bones that Lenin was supposed to build his utopia, but he didn't live long enough to see it through to completion. By 1927, he was dead. Trotsky was exiled, and Stalin, his petty criminal fundraiser for the party, was in complete control of the Soviet Union. Recollecting this turbulent time, Khrushchev says, quote, Here, we'd overthrown the monarchy and the bourgeoisie. We'd won our freedom, but people were living worse than before. No wonder, some asked, what kind of freedom is this? You promised us paradise. Maybe we'll reach paradise after death, but we'd like to have a taste of it here on Earth. We're not making any extravagant demands. Just give us a corner to live in. End quote. Throughout these years, Khrushchev had proved himself a deft leader of men and a skilled organizer for the party. But what he really wanted was to go to technical college. He desperately wanted an education to, to break the, the generations of peasant life of his family. In his heart, he wanted to be an engineer. He wanted to build things of great worth, to see them be used and utilized for the good of the motherland. But his party bosses didn't agree with him about his future. Personally, he hadn't found satisfaction in married life. He was already on his second divorce. And he had no time for the frivolity of a young man's life. Khrushchev, in fact, hated alcohol, and he despised the image of a drunkard. It was around this time that he met a woman he knew he could truly spend the rest of his life with. Nina Petrovna. She was a pure communist, a true believer, better educated than himself, and towed the party line like it was divine revelation. So now, being denied an education, he rose the ranks of the party and was even chose to attend the USSR Party Congress in 1925. It was here he first met Comrade Stalin. Soon after, Khrushchev was appointed as party organizer in Kiev. Beautiful city, and it overwhelmed Nikita in its grandeur. But Ukrainian nationalism was on the rise and it needed to be smothered out if Soviet communism was to flourish. And so, the mass arrests began. For anyone who's read Solzhenitsyn, you may remember the crime of wrecking. It was a charge slapped against those who were attempting to sabotage the Soviet Union in some way. Engineers, doctors, policemen, railroad conductors, no one was safe from accusations of wrecking, and all were suspect. It was a catch-all charge, and Khrushchev signed off on many of these arrests. But in the end, his sharp leadership in Kiev warranted his promotion to Moscow. And at 35 years old, with solid communist credentials under his belt, he was making good friends in the Kremlin. After Moscow, he was appointed head of the Industrial Academy Party Cell, the party boss of an entire district. Six months later, a bigger district. By January of 1932, he was second only to the Moscow Party boss. Two years later, he was Moscow Party boss and member of the Soviet Central Committee and party chief of an entire Moscow district, an area bigger than England. His upward mobility within the party was staggering. Yet while Khrushchev's futures rose, 
Millions upon millions of his fellow countrymen were dying. The communist concept of collectivizing agriculture was taking a toll on the peasantry that, that frankly reaches numbers difficult to grasp. We're all familiar with the six million Jews killed in the German Holocaust, but Stalin himself admitted to Churchill that nearly 10 million had died in an effort to collectivize farming. And that's just what he admitted to. With the Russian population literally starving to death from a man-made disaster, grumbles began to circulate in the Kremlin about the results of Stalinism. In response to his doubters, Stalin let loose a wave of terror that's so incomprehensibly evil that words can't really do it justice. The vast expanse of the Soviet Union was to suffer martyrdom for the sake of Stalinism. Every outward expression of any kind that was not precisely what the state demanded was strictly forbidden. If you failed in this task, you simply disappeared, whisked away by the NKVD, the blue cap secret police of the Soviet Union. Neighbors were so terrified of being accused of crimes against the state that they invented crimes to report against each other to show that they were vigilant defenders of Stalin, of communism, and of the Soviet Union. With one phone call from your neighbor, you were gone. And often, being reported on wasn't even a prerequisite for arrest. Party bosses were given quotas to find wreckers in their district, and they better not claim that all of their citizens were loyal. If they did, they themselves would be immediately suspect of being a wrecker, destroying the party from within. And so, random, baseless arrests, driven by fear and cults, swept across the country. All these poor souls, these victims and martyrs of the great utopian vision of Marx and Lenin were sent east to that grand, scattered, and rumored archipelago of gulags. There, these criminals slaved for the material need of the Soviet Union. To do true justice to the hardships endured by these people would be an entire podcast series in and of itself. All I can say about it is, read the gulag archipelago. No one was safe from Stalin's blue caps. All members of government who dared raise a voice to Stalin were shot. Any member of the military who questioned tactical strategy was shot. The intelligentsia who challenged the doctrines of Stalinism was shot. Their wives shot. Their children shot. Their friends shot. Their neighbors who gave them a bag of flour were shot. Taubman points out that during this time, Khrushchev not only survived, but he thrived. It was toward the end of this reign of terror when he joined the inner circle of Stalin. And at no point... In this part of his life, did he denounce any of it, any of the atrocities? He, in fact, promoted it. And thus, his name can be added alongside those closest to Stalin, those who had blood on their hands. Names like Molotov, Malenkov, Beria, and now, Khrushchev. In union now with these men, his complicity, in at least some part in the terror of the 30s, is undeniable. Quote, Stalin liked me. It would be stupid and sentimental to talk about this man loving anyone. But there's no doubt that he held me in great respect. Stalin treated me better than the others. Several Politburo members virtually considered me his pet. End quote. As one of Stalin's right-hand men, Khrushchev was ordered to assist in the war against the peasants, to continue collectivization, to steal their harvest. The Soviet Union needed more food. It needed them to hand over the bounty which their blood, sweat, and tears had cultivated. But Khrushchev's approach was different than Stalin's. He thought that the peasants simply didn't understand the benefits of communism. All they needed was someone to explain why their farms needed to be collectivized. So he attempted to yuck it up with the peasants, to converse personally with them and show them what great future lay ahead and what such a future demanded of them in the meantime. But in doing so, he came face to face with the unavoidable devastation being wrought by collectivization. He said he had, quote, no idea things were this bad. At the Industrial Academy, we'd been living under the illusion that everything was fine in the countryside. End quote. When Stalin was told how unenthusiastic the peasantry was to aid in the revolution, he called their lack of zeal for communism a, quote, dizziness from success. End quote. Back in Moscow, things weren't much better. Wages had fallen by half, and the laws were getting more and more punitive. Citizens were now denied the option to quit their jobs or change careers, and unemployment benefits were eliminated based on the axiom that under socialism, there could be no unemployment. When it came time to vote on a new central committee chair, Stalin won, of course, but 70% of those who voted against him were eventually shot or sent to the gulags. Stalin's own wife, in a way, was a victim of his reign. 
One night they had a fight after learning that he was sleeping around, and he allegedly threw a cigarette in her face, and she killed herself that very night with a bullet through her brain. Khrushchev remembered, quote, I stayed alive while most of my contemporaries, my classmates at the academy, my friends with whom I had worked in the party organization, lost their heads as enemies of the people. I often asked myself, how was I spared? The fact that I am truly devoted to the party has always been beyond doubt. But those comrades who perished were also devoted to the party. Why did I escape the fate that they suffered? In years later, Stalin sometimes attacked and insulted me, sometimes made rude remarks about me, but he always got over it. And right up until the last day of his life, he liked me, end quote. Nikita's own rise didn't only shock himself, but also confounded those around him. He was so uneducated, so bullish. He would say whatever was on his mind and often insulted people around him without thinking twice. But he was also affable and quick with a joke. He was always seen around the Kremlin, chatting with people in the hallways, jabbing his elbows into their ribs. When he would give speeches, he would often cast aside the prepared text and go off the cuff for hours, bouncing from thought to thought on this and that. And he did have a special drive and talent for industrial projects. He was able to boil difficulties down into simple problems that could be managed. In this arena, he excelled in updating the Moscow infrastructure, and he sunk his teeth into improvements desperately needed by a city that was growing at a huge rate. A visitor to the city during Nikita's rehab projects notes, quote, the streets had been excavated. There were long, muddy trenches, floored with dirty planks. Heaps of soil lay everywhere. The whole city was in a mess, and heavily loaded trucks were busy shifting the accumulated debris. Everywhere, one saw long fences around the metro stations that were under construction. Everywhere, scaffolding shrouded half-built skyscrapers and houses. In every quarter of the city, the earth shook with the ringing of hammers, the banging, bumping, and screeching of single-bucket excavators, concrete mixers, and machines that turned out mortar. Thousands of men worked day and night with almost fanatical diligence. The streets were full of one-horse carriages, their boxes occupied by surly drivers. In the center of the city, there were some large, very up-to-date trolley buses. End quote. From Khrushchev himself, quote, It was a period of feverish activity, and stupendous progress was made in short time. The huge task of overseeing all this was largely mine, because Kaganovich was up to his ears in work outside the Moscow Party organization. In addition to putting up new buildings, there was a lot to be done in modernizing the most basic metropolitan services. Moscow sewage and water drainage systems were long out of date, and there was no water mains in the city. Most of the streets were cobblestone, and some were completely unpaved. Much of the city's transport was still horse-drawn. It's incredible to look back on it all, but things were really that primitive. End quote. And still, during all of these Khrushchev projects, those closest to him fell to the NKVD. Arrested, shot, liquidated, disappeared. All of it was ramping up. At times, Khrushchev himself had to sign on the arrest documents, though he admitted he had no idea what was legitimate or not. Quote, When a list was put together of people who should be exiled from the city, I didn't know where these people were sent. I never asked. We always followed the rule that if you weren't told something, that meant it didn't concern you. It was the state's business and the less you knew about it, the better. End quote. Khrushchev's loyalty paid off. In January of 1938, he was appointed as the party's man to oversee all of Ukraine. And so, for a decade, he ruled that nation as something of a micro-autocrat. Outside of Moscow, he could rule as his own man, without the cold breath of Stalin down his neck. Those under him liked him. He was approachable and reasonable. They could come to him with legitimate issues without fear of being shot. But the arrests under Stalin's purge had decimated the Ukraine, and anyone of any talent was gone in every sector. Khrushchev lamented what such policies were doing to the infrastructure. But nonetheless, under Khrushchev's rule, the arrests in Ukraine continued. And in reality, there was probably little he could actually do about it. The group of predecessors who had been in charge of the Ukraine before him had failed to rein in its pesky nationalism. All were either tortured and shot, tortured and disappeared, or suicided themselves and their wives. Their kids, then, were either shot or sent to the gulags. I'm sure you're picking up on a pattern here. Khrushchev, no doubt, was aware of these people's fates, and his fear of Stalin, however, was beginning to transform into something else. One day, he went to call on an old friend, Ilya Kosenko, who he had known when he was stationed in Kiev in his earlier days. Seven limousines pulled up into a small country cottage, 
and out stepped Nikita Khrushchev. And to a little girl in the front yard, he said, quote, Are you the daughter? Go, call your father. End quote. But instead, the little girl shouted towards the house, quote, Father, you better go. They've come to arrest you. End quote. When Ilya Kosenko emerged from his home, he was trembling. So Khrushchev took him inside, where they could talk privately. And there, Khrushchev confided in his old friend that one day, he would take care of Stalin. And after he left, his friend Ilya told his daughter, quote, Get this straight. If you mention a word of this conversation to even one person, they'll shoot both him and me. End quote. From what Nikita could see, the NKVD was completely out of control. There was no rhyme or reason to who lived and who died. He saw it as a sort of mad self-extermination of their own party. And when he considered the damage being done to the peasantry, the very people who were promised so much and who had given so much, all while having so little to actually offer, a secret anger began to burn. Nikita devoted most of his time to building the agriculture of Ukraine. He understood the peasants better than most people from the Kremlin. To one aide he hired to help him, he said, quote, Don't drive up in a car. Arrive on foot so the peasants can see that you're their sort of man. You don't smoke, do you? Well, take tobacco anyway, because almost all peasants smoke. And you'll need to win them over so as to get them to open up. Don't raise any bureaucratic issues. Give them a chance to think. Once you've done that, ask them how they'd react if they had to drop their own plan instead of getting one from Stalin. Take your time and see if you can get them to plan. End quote. Khrushchev was made a national hero over his successes in Ukraine, but all that was cut short by war with Germany. He himself was forced to evacuate his post in Kiev under bombardment. The Soviets fought the Germans hard. But those young idealistic soldiers who were captured and escaped from Germany were consequently now mistrusted by Stalin. And so, these returning warriors, instead of receiving a veteran's pension, were shipped off to the gulags. Before long, many captured Soviets simply opted for German captivity over that of their homeland. In the end, 27 million Soviet citizens died in World War II. 1,700 Russian towns and 70,000 small villages had been completely destroyed. 32,000 factories were just gone. 52,000 miles of railway was now unusable. 100,000 collective farms were totally eliminated. 30% of the vast nation's wealth had vanished. And yet, Stalin's purge, primarily advocated by Lavrenti Beria as head of the NKVD, continued in appalling fashion. The church was a primary target, with assassinated bishops piling up. And at one point, Khrushchev found his office staff was missing. He inquired with Beria's office as to who among them was still alive. All of them were dead, shot by the NKVD. Khrushchev, in response, was heard to mutter that they were destroying people for no reason. Picking up the pieces after the war, Khrushchev visited the town of his birth, Kalinovka. The townspeople, destitute as they were, were nonetheless full of pride at having such an accomplished man hail from their village. But they were ashamed that they had nothing to offer their esteemed guest. No food to grant him a feast with. No money to throw him a parade with. But Khrushchev wasn't stupid. He knew all of this. Instead, he showered his hometown with grain and fruit, chicken, tea, and horses to assist in the field. His own grandmother emerged from a hut and shouted that he was their czar. But most of the Soviet bloc wasn't so fortunate. Record crop failure was blighting everything east of Berlin. In response, instead of reducing quotas from the peasantry, Stalin increased them. Quote, Soon, I was receiving letters and official reports about deaths from starvation. Then, the cannibalism started. I received a report that a human head and the soles of feet had been found under a little bridge near Vasilovo, a town outside Kiev. Apparently, the corpse had been eaten. End quote. Khrushchev's own party chief in Odessa sent him a retelling of a scene witnessed when checking on the productivity of the farms. Quote, the woman had the corpse of her own child on the table, and she was cutting it up. She was chattering away while she worked. We've eaten Menechka which is little Maria. Now we'll salt down Venechka, which is little Ivan. This will keep us for some time. 
As I retell this story, my thoughts go back to that period. I can see that horrible scene vividly in my mind. There was nothing I could do. End quote. Soon, Khrushchev was transferred back to Moscow from Kiev, where he rejoined the inner circle of Stalin, and he found himself again with Molotov, Malenkov, and Beria. The group's late-night antics amid the incomprehensible suffering of their countrymen is stomach-turning, to be honest with you. Stalin would force everyone to drink themselves under the table, and then they would watch American westerns, eat to excess, and play pranks on each other. For example, Beria pinned the words prick on the back of Khrushchev's jacket as he left for the night. Molotov was part of the old guard, one of the true believers of the Soviet system. As for Malenkov, he was, on paper, the one who would replace Stalin as he was in charge of the party apparatus. Beria was head of the NKVD, the secret police that pulled all the strings. When he wasn't fulfilling his bloodlust of executions and gulag fodder, he would go out at night and hunt for young women to kidnap into his limousine, drug, rape, and then bring flowers to the next morning to cover the fact that anything involuntary had occurred. What's more, Beria was cunning, treacherous, unforgiving, viciously pragmatic, and he controlled the nuclear missile program, and commanded such loyalty from the NKVD that even Stalin had to respect his power. To protect himself, he kept files on everyone. This was the intimate den of vipers that Khrushchev was now firmly entrenched. On March 1st, 1953, Stalin's maid and guards found him barely conscious, lying on the floor in a puddle of his own piss. Malenkov was called first, followed by Beria, who ordered that no one be told about Stalin's condition. Malenkov then arrived at Stalin's bedside, followed by Beria, followed by Khrushchev. The details are a bit foggy, but it appears Beria delayed the doctors by about 12 hours with the intention of allowing Stalin to slowly die. Beria himself basically admitted this to the inner circle. Three days later, Stalin began choking and gasping. His eyes went wild, described as insane-looking by Khrushchev. Khrushchev, in fact, said it looked like the fear of death had gripped him. The dictator raised his arms upward as if pointing to something, or, as Khrushchev thought, bringing a curse down upon the men around him. And finally, after a few moments, the despot's flesh gave up the spirit. With the death of Stalin, Beria left immediately to use his foothold on the NKVD to gain leverage against all his competitors to the Soviet throne. Melenkov did the same. He was, after all, technically next in line, although he had half the wit and drive of Beria. Molotov? Molotov stayed stoic and simply awaited his turn, as he thought it would inevitably come, but he grossly underestimated the ambitions of those around him. Khrushchev? Knowing he was underestimated by all three, and knowing that he would either be a target to be removed or sought as a gainful ally, simply kept watch of the movements around him. In addition to the gamesmanship drama in Stalin's wake, they had to deal with the issue of the 2.5 million souls trapped in the gulag system. Neither Khrushchev or any of Stalin's men had anything against the prisoners, and further, they didn't see locking people up as much of a political strategy anyway. And then there were foreign issues that were left unresolved. The West, led by the Americans, had never quite left Berlin after the war. ICBMs, military bases, and tank divisions sat idle in Western Europe. The Americans started this era with massive air superiority over the Soviet Union, and everyone in Stalin's circle knew it. This was the Soviet Union bequeathed to these men. Reform was going to happen to one degree or another. The status quo only existed to support the regime of one man who was now dead. The question was, who would get the credit as the reformer, and what would that reform look like? At the moment, it looked like the future belonged to Beria, and despite all having blood on their hands, it was Beria who was swimming in it. His calculating personality was in full drive, and Khrushchev knew that if Beria won out, they would likely all be shot. Beria was too dangerous to be kept alive, and so the plotting began. Khrushchev first deftly recruited the ever-stoic Molotov, and then once he could prove that Melenkov would be targeted by Beria, he was brought in as well. Before long, the military was included in the coup, namely General Zhukov, the hero of World War II. Zhukov brought in his underling, Leonid Brezhnev. Other members of the Soviet Presidium were then brought on board, for finding enemies of Beria was not proving to be a difficult task. The Presidium meeting began at noon, and Khrushchev opened up by laying the charges against Beria out on the table. 
Malenkov then pressed a hidden button that signaled Zhukov and the other military brass to burst in and arrest Beria. Six months later, at a trial that involved no lawyers, no witnesses, and no appeals, Beria was condemned for his crimes against the state. But what disgusted everyone the most was the long list of women, including well-known Russian actresses who he had raped. Once his death sentence was read, he began shouting and screaming maniacally, so a towel was shoved into his mouth to gag him. Then a blindfold was put over his eyes. And as he kicked and strained and begged to be let go, one of his eyes slipped over the blindfold, just in time to see a three-star general hold a gun against his forehead and pull the trigger. Khrushchev then ordered his body be burned immediately. It was Khrushchev who had organized the coup. It was Khrushchev who had pulled everyone together, including the military, into a unified force against the monster Beria. It was also Khrushchev who, amid the Presidium members, had the most actual experience in governing anything. He was far more in tune with the peasantry and the working class of the Soviet Union than the rest of the Presidium. He had traveled more than any of them. He had seen the farms and the factories in person. He could relate to anyone, joke with anyone, argue and hold his ground with anyone. And now... He had just organized the execution of the de facto leader of the Soviet Union, a man that not that long ago was thought to be untouchable. In the months that followed, people began deferring to Nikita Khrushchev for decisions. Malenkov's stock quickly fell as he was seen of something as a puppet to Beria before his execution. And Molotov was too much of a purist to be useful to the way Khrushchev saw the Soviet Union needed to go. And so, every day that went by, Khrushchev sidelined them and the Stalinist more and more. By September of 1953, Nikita Khrushchev was the first secretary of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, and he was firmly in control of his office. In February of 1956, Khrushchev ordered the 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party to convene. Every country in the Soviet bloc sent delegates as well as emissaries from other communist parties. In total, there were 1,355 voting delegates. The reason for the Congress, many thought, would be to determine the post-Stalin direction for the party. All of them expected to see lavish memorials and hear misty-eyed speeches about their former great leader. But when the delegates arrived, there wasn't even a photo of Stalin hanging on a wall. Khrushchev opened the Congress by acknowledging the deaths of three leaders of the communist movement, and he casually threw in Stalin's name with the other two nobodies. The delegates were thoroughly confused. They all knew Stalin had died, but who the hell were these other guys and why were they presented as being on the same level as Stalin? He then went on to give a vague condemnation against cults of personality and lawlessness in government that some thought were references to Beria. But on the last day of the Congress, Soviet delegates were assembled for a last-minute secret session. Khrushchev took to the podium and unleashed a torrent of attacks directly at Stalin by name. He laid upon the dictator's legacy charges of grave abuses of power, mass arrests and executions without trial or investigation. He went on to say that his reign of terror had created a state of insecurity, fear, and desperation. He called his rule contrary to common sense. He recalled Stalin's personal favorite method of getting a confession was to beat, beat, and once again beat. Khrushchev went on to proclaim that Stalin had the blood of good and innocent communists on his hands. He accused him of being an incompetent wartime leader, of leaving his nation terribly unprepared for the Nazi threat. He blamed him personally for the ruination of Russian agriculture, laying the deaths of untold millions upon his grave. Finally, he ended with a plea that his words be kept in this room, lest their enemies use them against the party. When he finished his speech, you could hear a pin drop. The delegates didn't know how to react, and of course, despite his request for secrecy, Khrushchev did want his words to be made public. In the weeks that followed, Nikita Khrushchev's secret speech was published millions of times over and dispersed throughout the Soviet bloc. Even the New York Times published a copy. This moment for Khrushchev was his Pontius Pilate moment. This was him washing his hands free of the blood that he was very much complicit in. In doing so, he thought he could usher in a new Soviet Union, one that would catch up to or even outpace the Americans, instead of just avoiding them like Stalin did. It was him providing himself with a blank canvas to fill the role of reformer. But his words had long repercussions beyond just his political goals. Within months, all over the Soviet Union, Stalin's pictures disappeared from shopkeepers' walls. The statues began toppling at the hands of angry mobs whose lives had met their near ruin from his arrest. Then, 
Khrushchev opened up the gulags, and from out of the foggy cold of Siberia came the millions of thralls exiled to a life of misery. Almost all had their cases re-examined and thrown out, and they picked up what they could of their former lives, but many were still angry. Khrushchev, of all people, had struck the first blow against communism in Russia. The armor was chinked, the beast was unmasked. If there can be said to be a beginning of the end of Soviet Russia, it can be traced to the secret speech given by Nikita Khrushchev at the 20th Congress. Though he had achieved the number one spot in one of the most powerful forces on earth, and he had proved himself a skillful Machiavellian, picking up the pieces left behind by Stalin and Beria would be no small task. He certainly had no idea that two of his most formidable foes would be a couple of Irish Catholic brothers half his age from Massachusetts. you found the first half of Nikita Khrushchev's life as interesting and unexpected as I did. Check back in two weeks for part two of The Brinksman. I think you'll find the end of his life to be even more unexpected. If you found this little history podcast worthy of at least a dollar, please head over to my Patreon page and become a contributor. Every dollar helps purchase research material and pays for all the back-of-house expenses associated with this project. You can sign up at patreon.com slash writtenandbloodhistory. Another huge way to help me out is to leave ratings or reviews wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews and ratings are pretty much how little podcasts like mine reach people organically. If you'd like to get a hold of me, you can send me an email at stephen.dejulius at gmail.com, or my Twitter handle is at sdejulius, or shoot me a message on the Facebook page. This podcast is a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network, and if you guys are looking for other great podcasts out there, including a nice little history selection, you should go check them out at evergreenpodcast.com. And so, thank you so much for listening to Written in Blood History. See you later.